Coming up, the sounds of ceremonial stomp dance. The noise that you just heard, my grandmother would say that sounds like that creep, the water flowing there. How David Crawler learned to make turtle shell shakers and the voices they represent. And international businessman Tim Roberts. We travel halfway around the world to learn how he's working on behalf of the Cherokee people. So for us, where we go next isn't as important as the fact that we continue to go to the next place. Plus, we have a big important episode today and we dive right in with Dr. Kim Talbear to talk about Native American DNA. Blogger and podcaster Adrian Keene, taking on the tough topics that keep Native America talking. The Cherokees. A thriving American Indian tribe. Our history. Our culture. Our people. Our future. The principles of a historic nation sewn into the fabric of a modern world. Hundreds of thousands strong. Learning. Growing. Succeeding. And steadfast. In the past, we have persevered through struggle. But the future is ours to write. OCO. 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 These are the voices of the Cherokee people. I'm Cherokee Nation Principal Chief Chuck Hoskin, Jr. On behalf of Cherokee citizens, I'm pleased to present OCO, Voices of the Cherokee People, a program dedicated to Cherokee history and heritage. The stories you will see represent Cherokee values, pride, and culture. We hope you enjoy it. What up? OCO, it's how we say hello in Cherokee. I'm your host, Jennifer Lauren, at the historic Hunter's Home in Park Hill, Oklahoma, former home of Cherokee photographer Jenny Ross Cobb. We'll have more on her story a little later in the show. But first, for centuries, Cherokees have worshipped at ceremonial stomp grounds. It's a spiritual practice that many still embrace today. Turtle shell shakers are a sacred part of that tradition. And just as Stomp Dance has survived, David Crawler is one of the few people who's ensuring that that part of our culture survives along with it. The noise that you just heard, my grandmother would say that sounds like that creek, the water flowing there when you hear them, you know, she said it, it's, it's making that creek sound that the water makes, these. Uskani, Jude Jayosti, Dawadon, Yonega Hagan, David Crawler. Gada Yoste, Ahano, Awatosa, Ahan, Ahanji Dado. I grew up right here, right here where I'm at, Marble City. Ina, uh, Doc Kayota, a little Tartli, you know, the was Tartli, Lido, Oz, Duni Kayot, you stotty. It usually takes about two weeks in a real hot, sunny day to get them good and dry. You have to hang them out and let them air out, you know. No, let no, I don't do Tesco. You can leave the new old town to the town. No, they got the hunt. No one, you know. The least, Tana, the good lad, Tana, and the dog, the class, go, you know. Stay down there, you know, here, go down. So when we clean them turtles and get them to this stage here, my granddaughters and I pick up rocks and, you know, pop lids to put in there and put them together with a baling wire and drill holes in them. Before I used to know him, you have to make them sound the same, all sound the same. And uh, sometimes you have to add just a little bit more, you know, to get the same sound. 
about, about like that. You try to get them, this one has eight. They have to be like an even number, you know. Sometimes if you don't even them out, the sound will be a lot different. You have to have even number. So one won't sound heavier than the other, you know. My grandmother, her name was uh, Nancy, Nancy Pettit. She's the one that uh, kind of got me into to this, you know, because she talked a lot about her grandmother and that her grandmother made uh, these shakers here, turtle shell shakers. And then she wanted somebody in our family to, to continue doing that, you know. I guess the way she taught me was she challenged me things, you know, like, like sometimes the wood, you know. She said, I bet you can't bust up all that wood. I said, I bet you I can, you know. And that's how she got the work done, I guess, out of me, you know. And this, uh, whenever uh, she was talking about these, clean them out, and she showed me how. And she said, I said, I go to the docks, you know, and they go to the docks, you know, I bet you I can make them. Sometimes on Saturday nights when they were dancing at the stomp ground, Stoke stomp ground over here, we'd go there and visit. There was a lot of family members that went there. Hina Dakstina said, Anige, do nana, Sato, Aniska, Nahali, don't. Hina Nige, do nana, Sato, Anista, Deho, Ahali, don't. So, uh, the, it's the, only the girls and women that wear these turtle shell shakers and they follow the lead guy who's leading and uh, keep the rhythm up while he's singing. You know, the girls wear them. They say a long time ago that stomp dance was, was given to us by God and that for stomp dance to happen, you have to have men and women that they're equally important, that it's about balance and harmony. And women, we don't sing with our voices. I've been told that the turtle shells are our voices and that when someone who makes turtle shells, that us women taking their shell around the fire and using those as our voices keeps their spirit alive. There's a rhythm to the songs. It's like a, a heartbeat, and that's the way that our dances are. So when those men sing, they sing with that, that rhythm. And so when we dance, we move our feet in a shuffle step, and it's supposed to fit with the way that those men are singing. So they, they come together as two parts of the same whole. I really believe that these little kids and my granddaughters and grandchildren to come, they'll be making this someday. Cause, uh, those little girls, they watch everything you do and say, so they'll be good turtle shell shackle makers. I'm glad they're learning, you know, I'm glad they, but they want to, you know. At least it won't die out, it won't die away, you know. Years to come, they'll still be dancing. And Like I said, they, these shells have a living spirit. When I hear the shells, for me, it's just home. For me, it, it makes me think of everyone who has come before me. I think about all that whenever I hear stomp dance, whenever I hear the shells, when I hear the songs, and I think about responsibility to community. 
because it's our responsibility to carry this forward. It's up to us. And it's an honor that it's up to us. Native American cultures have been stereotyped and misrepresented for decades. That's something Cherokee academic and activist Adrian Keene is bringing renewed attention to. First as a popular blogger and now as the host of a podcast, Adrian is using her platforms to bring contemporary Native American issues to the mainstream. Osio, and welcome back to another episode of All My Relations. I'm Adrian Keene, and I'm a Cherokee scholar, blogger, professor at Brown University, and co-host of the All My Relations podcast. We have a big, important episode today, and we dive right in with Dr. Kim Talbear to talk about Native American DNA, and then we talk about potential alternatives for thinking about kinship as markers of Native belonging rather than biology. Hi everyone, I'm Adrienne Keen. I am a citizen of the Cherokee Nation and I'm originally from California. Um, my talk tonight is gonna be about cultural appropriation, thinking through specifically kind of focusing in on this one concept of the hipster headdress. I grew up in San Diego with my mom and dad and a younger sister. And my grandma um, moved to Los Angeles from Oklahoma when she was 18. Most of my extended family is in Oklahoma. When I was growing up in California, um, I did not have a Native community around. I grew up in suburban San Diego, a not very diverse community in a lot of ways. So it was really hard growing up to try and figure out what that actually meant to be a Cherokee person. I always knew that I was Cherokee because my grandma had grown up in rural Oklahoma. She had gone to Shilako Indian School for high school. So we had all these stories. I kind of knew uh, that my family were Indians, but I didn't really know what that meant until I was a lot older. And so for me, it's been this journey of reconnection and reestablishing those relationships and trying to really figure out what it means to be a Cherokee woman because I grew up separated from that. So this is what happens when you Google image search the term Native American. Largely images from the historic past or they're fictional, they're like paintings or drawings. I went to undergrad at Stanford University, which has an amazing Native community. That was a place where I really started to learn about Native representations and the power of the ways that were represented by mainstream media, through sports mascots, through all of these things, because Stanford used to have an Indian mascot. So until 1971, they were the Stanford Indians, and it was changed due to student activism. So there's this spirit of understanding the power of representations at Stanford. And then I was accepted to graduate school on the East Coast. At Harvard, I was one of only a couple of Native doctoral students at the entire university, and I faced a lot of real ignorance from my classmates and from even my faculty. The story that I always tell is the start of Native appropriations. There's an Urban Outfitters across the street from Harvard Graduate School of Education. And in 2010-11 was kind of the start of the resurgence of these tribal trends in fashion. And Urban Outfitters had this bargain basement that was full of every stereotype imaginable. So I remember distinctly there was this entire table of totem pole jewelry stands and these neon dream catchers and these big fake feathered earrings and t-shirts with headdresses on them, fake mucklucks, like everything you can imagine. And that day when I was walking through the store, um, something kind of clicked and I realized that my classmates at Harvard and my faculty, they only ever saw images like that of Native people. So I decided that that was 
a problem, um, and that was something I wanted to write about and explore. So I started my blog, Native Appropriations. It wasn't anything fancy, but it started out as a place to catalog all of these instances of misrepresentation. And through the years, it's grown from this sort of cataloging to a place where I can explore more deeply what these representations really mean. And that's where I found a lot of power in my voice is being able to use tools like Twitter or Instagram to educate folks in these really short and simple ways, but be very impactful about talking about Indigenous issues and hopefully change people's minds. I'm a faculty member at Brown. I know that in the spaces at Brown, I'm often one of the only Native people in those spaces at the faculty meetings. I'm only the second Indigenous person that Brown has ever hired in a tenure track position. So I see my role there as being able to help Indigenous students to be successful in those spaces. For Native students coming to non-native colleges and universities or predominantly white institutions, it can feel really isolating. Um, it can feel like you don't belong in these spaces. And I think what I try to express to our students is that our ancestors signed treaties and many of them promised education for our people in perpetuity. So they are exercising their treaty rights by being on this campus and by getting their college degree. And the skills and knowledge that they're gaining in these spaces can be put into immediate use in our communities. And for the Native students in the, the classrooms, their peers are directly benefiting from learning about their experiences, about hearing uh, what it's like to be a contemporary Native person. That interpersonal exchange is really powerful and important too, and does a lot of work for changing perceptions of what the rest of America thinks of Native people. In 1896, a young Cherokee named Jenny Ross Cobb became the first female Native American photographer. The great-granddaughter of Principal Chief John Ross, Jenny was raised in the Tahlequah and Park Hill areas of the Cherokee Nation in Indian Territory. Around the turn of the century and with the development of consumer-level cameras and mobile photography technology, the craft was no longer limited to professionals. As photography became a popular hobby, the leading camera manufacturer, Kodak, marketed a successful advertising campaign toward women. It was during this era that Jenny received her first camera at the age of six. Cherokee people have always been known as early adopters of new technology, especially during this time in our history. Jenny Ross Cobb's early interest in photography is further proof of that notion. This Bausch & Lomb camera belonged to Jenny, before the advent of film, she developed the glass negatives herself in a retrofitted closet of the hunter's home where she lived. Today, 21 prints of Jenny's original images are kept safe in the Oklahoma Historical Society's photo archives. This is the Jenny Ross Cobb collection, and these are prints that were made from glass plate negatives. Jenny captured images of the world around her at a pivotal moment in time, immediately preceding statehood in 1907, when Oklahoma absorbed the Cherokee Nation into its borders. In a time when the majority of outward-facing Cherokee representations were based off of stereotypes or falsehoods, Cobb's photos show real Cherokee people in their everyday lives. The disparities in representation are stark. Jenny Ross Cobb attended school at the Cherokee Female Seminary in what is now Tahlequah, Oklahoma. Many of her photos documented the daily lives of her fellow students, middle and upper class young Cherokee women. When the railroad came to Tahlequah in 1902, Jenny and her friends were there to explore the Iron Road. Other photos depict a town carnival. Another is a timeless image of Cherokees enjoying watermelon slices on a summer day. There's so much that goes into creating a quality glass plate negative. 
and every level of this creation, like the settings and um, the way she captured it, it ended up becoming being a perfect balance and a perfect representation. In the 1950s, Jenny returned to her childhood residence, Hunter's Home, to advise the Oklahoma Historical Society on its restoration of the house. Its early architecture and furnishings had been recorded in photos by Jenny in the early 1900s. And it was these photographs that enabled an accurate restoration of the only surviving plantation home in the state. Now, more than a century later, at this historic site, Jenny Ross Cobb's legacy lives on. Let's talk Cherokee. See you all in the world. See you all in the world. What are you doing? Gadot hadane. Gadot hadane. What are you doing? Gadot hadane. Gadot hadane. Tim Roberts is a businessman representing Cherokee Nation businesses at home and halfway around the world. We followed Tim from Tulsa, Oklahoma to the United Arab Emirates to show how he's building international bridges on behalf of Cherokee Nation citizens. What I like about going to new countries, you meet people that really just know their situation. They know the world by what's immediately around them. It just gives you a little bit different perspective on, on what's important and what's not. My name is Tim Roberts. I'm from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, I work for Cherokee Nation Business's Federal Solutions Division. So I was born in Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1979. The circumstances changed a little bit to where it was necessary to move to Grove, Oklahoma. You know, things kind of beyond our control. It certainly wasn't the circumstance I would have picked, but it turned out to be the best thing that could have happened. We simplified our life on a number of levels. It was a lot like going back in time. We went from growing up in Bixby, which is more or less a part of Tulsa, to living in the same house that my great-grandfather had built in the 50s. There's a sort of heavy time to go through a lot of change. You wake up the next day and realize everything keeps on going. We got to keep all the things that mattered. It, it's a lesson in uh, you know, what you carry around on you is pretty much all that you really need, and uh, that's always stuck with me. It was meaningful. I mean, for me, it was a chance to connect with with the history that I'd learned from my parents and my grandparents, but never really gotten to experience. You know, most of my family had been and lived around that area since, since the removal. They're um, people that lived off the land, they raised cattle. Um, some of them spoke Cherokee and some of them didn't. Being raised in Cherokee to me is just intensely and overwhelmingly dedicated to the community. You, you take care of each other and, and, and everybody around you. At Cherokee Nation Businesses, I'm over our International Expansion Division, which is a goal we have set to take some of the federal contracting expertise we've developed over the last eight to ten years and expand that to some of the global installations that the federal government operates. Most of our, our contracts are, say, um, providing, for example, IT services at a federal site for somebody like the USDA. Um, and one of them was under the Air Force, doing some uh, civil engineering type work. Not only is it international, it's in a, it's in a danger zone. The first international office was in Baghdad, Iraq. That, that was a project where we took our best people. So, you know, ahead of our HR group, our finance, legal, um, you name it, everybody had to step in and figure out how to do business in Iraq. It was sort of a life's calling kind of moment, you know? Like you, you wake up and say, whatever I did yesterday, I don't do anymore. From now on, this is what I do. And we loved it. After we had proven successful in Baghdad, um, we, we approached them about working in Abu Dhabi and they gave us the opportunity to do that. And that led to what is now what we call our Diplomatic Support Division contract in the UAE. The 
architecture is is sort of representative of what's happened in the country the last 50 years. You know, they decided when they formed the UAE, the seven Emirates that make up the United Arab Emirates, um, that that they were going to lead with a lot of integrity, um, a lot of transparency, um, and a lot of fairness to all of the Emirati people. And so it made it a great place for us to go in and, and do business. The, the thing that, that made it unique for us is we weren't just operating inside an embassy. We actually had to go and establish Cherokee Nation businesses Abu Dhabi. We had to set up a branch of Cherokee within, within the local economy through their local government. The U.S. Embassy in Abu Dhabi they have a function there that they outsource um, to provide deployment support. So whenever um, the military trainers as part of, the, part of the foreign military sales program or our customs and border protection officials um, are stationed in the UAE, uh, somebody has to get their stuff there and somebody has to find and lease them a home, a car, get them a cell phone, and otherwise get their life set up and prepared for them to be deployed um, to Abu Dhabi. And so we got the opportunity to take on that contract. It took us about a year to get established, but now we're, um, we're, I think, in our second year of that contract, performing really well. When you go to set up a business entity in a different country, everything is different. Legally, you're required to have a sponsor. Saeed al and his family's company have, since the day we landed in Abu Dhabi, said they fill the role as a sponsor, which you're required to have, but what they were able to do also is provide a partnership. Um, they've helped us learn the culture, they've helped us learn the legal system, they've navigated problems where, um, you know, we've tried everything. Um, there's a lot of pride in their family, and that's what you see with, when the, with Emiratis because, you know, his father was a pearl diver. You know, before oil and before the UAE was a, an organized country, there was no commerce besides, you know, pearl diving. And they're all very diligent stewards of, of that and trying to live up to their father's name who created this business. And Said is really an exceptional representative of his family. To me, when you see the, the Emirati culture, you see people striving to make the most of what they have to make it sustainable. When you see these people building some of the most significant structures that have ever been built, they're clearly trying to make their mark. And it's, it, it's literally and metaphorically a beacon uh, of, of hope and prosperity for a lot of people that need it. And I think we can all, as Cherokees, relate to that. 50 years ago, things looked a lot different than they do now. But um, when I look at Cherokees and the change and the opportunity we have to um, preserve what's important to us, but at the same time adapt and, and make the most of, of the opportunities we have for what's coming after us, I, I see uh, the same spirit in the Emiratis as, as you see in Cherokee. So for us, where we go next isn't as important as the fact that we continue to go to the next place. Whatever it is that I'm doing, making sure there's other Cherokees behind me learning how to do it. We hope you enjoyed our show. And remember, you can always watch entire episodes and share your favorite stories online at oco.tv. There is no Cherokee word for goodbye because we know we'll see you again. We say, Dora dago ha'i. Wado.